Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 69 of the podcast. It's the 26th of April, 2017, as I record this intro. And it's Q&A time. Anna Brown and Ann Oman are here again to help me answer your questions. This month, we talk about power struggles, navigating relationships, math and moments of panic, and unschooling and autism. Uh, not much has happened around here this week. Actually, it's been a week already. It's gone really quickly. I've been finishing up reading and making notes for the book chat with Emma, which we'll actually be recording later today. And with spring here, I've been getting outside and cleaning up overgrown and fallen brush. Joseph's been helping me with that, and my dad's been prepping the porch for painting, so productive fun all around. And a big thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I really appreciate all of my patrons. You guys inspire me, and I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And this week, I want to share a quote from the episode, something that Anne said. Unschooling is about seeing, honoring, and living in the flow of a child's life. I really love that. We talk so much about honoring our children's needs and wishes and flow because that is the big shift beyond the conventional attitude towards children. Unschooling is life. Parents and children living together. Our lives intertwined. Our children's flow as valuable as our own. I thought it was a lovely image. And now, on to your questions. Welcome to another Q&A episode. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and I am so happy to be joined again by Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello, hello. Thanks again so much for joining me for another month. And would you like to get us started with the first question, Ann? I would love to. The first question is from Chelsea in Florida, and she writes, I'm new to unschooling since December, but I've always homeschooled. My daughter is seven and my son is five. I've listened to hours of podcasts and read scores of web pages about unschooling, but I'm struggling. My son has always been an amazing individual boy. He wants, he knows what he wants, will stop at nothing to get it, will accept no substitutions, etc. I admire his ability to know himself so deeply and to not back down from what he wants. However, he is also extremely physical. He has zero concept of personal space. He is constantly climbing on me, touching me in ways I don't like, wanting to play roughhouse tickling games, and hitting or biting and scratching when he doesn't get his way. His primary target is his sister. His individuality and aggression have led to tons of power struggles and conflicts over the last five years. I feel like I'm to blame because I've always been very physical with him when we play, and my husband and I also have a difficult time controlling our tempers when our buttons invariably get pushed. I feel like he is both parroting our behaviors and vying for power. Being the youngest and most inflexible, he has always tended to be forced into doing things because the rest of the family wants to do something else. So instead of having a home filled with joy and connection, our home is filled with conflict, fighting, and yelling. I desperately want a reset button, but I fear that in five and seven years, I've already done so much damage. I don't see any forward progress, and I feel full of doubt and guilt. Doubt and guilt. Help. Well, hello, Chelsea. Uh, I hear you. It sounds like there's a lot going on and a lot of layers to everything, and I really understand how it can feel so confusing and overwhelming. And I have good news for you. You do have a reset button. <laughs> and... I'm actually so glad you wished for one because I am in love with this concept now. <laughs> I'm going to use it a lot. 
uh, with each new moment. We do have a reset button, but we need to remember that we can stop our current line of thought, words, and actions and hit that reset button and breathe and then start all over again. A, a really important gift that this reset button gives to us is that it wipes away mistakes we made in the past, whether that mistake was 30 seconds ago or five years ago. So when you do remember to stop and hit your reset button, remember that the first thing it does is allow you to forgive yourself, release your guilt, and start again with a clean slate. That is so important that you don't bring those feelings into this present moment. So hit that reset button to do just that. So yeah, this moment right now, right now is your reset button. And it's there to keep you living mindfully in each new moment. So now you get to decide how you're going to go forward after you hit that reset button. Um, I love that you spoke of how you admire your son for knowing himself so deeply. Now, I think you can take that admiration of him uh, that you have and carry that bit of shine over to where you are having challenges with him. Uh, you say he's extremely physical and that's causing problems. Perhaps use your fabulous reset button now to erase anything else you're holding on to, any other definitions of him that may be clouding you from seeing him and truly helping him and ask what he might be in need of that will allow him to shine and to feel good about himself because that's what matters here the most. That's what I've always reached for with my kids and I still do with them being adults, to help them get to a place where they're feeling good about themselves no matter what. Uh, and part of that is making sure that they can see themselves shining in my eyes. So having said that, and thinking about what he may need in his life, here are a few things I'm wondering about. I wonder if you've explored the possibility that he may have sensory processing issues, sensory integration um, issues. It might be worth it for you to look into that because... Um, his behavior may be him trying to get some sensory sensations that he needs. If they need, um, you know, physical touch, big muscle use and everything. And it also might be a re reaction to having sensory overload by having too much going on that he can't handle at any, he acts out physically because of that. Uh, the book that was very helpful to me, um, in this area was the out of sync child, um, and back then there weren't many books. And now just today I typed the word sensory books in an Amazon search and so much came up. So even books for kids. And I think that is amazing that there's so much offered now. And it's a common uh, topic of conversation to help our kids, to understand our kids and how they work, to help them. Um, and on the Shine on, with Unschooling list every month, we put a post through that lists sensory fulfilling activities for kids. Um, that list was compiled by longtime Shine member Tracy Thornburg. Thank you, Tracy. And I have it on my website at uh, shinewithunschooling.com. So if you go there and read that list, you can get an idea of things that your son might need in order to feel whole and connected and grounded in his body, mind, and spirit. Um, another thing to explore is um, how is his diet? Pay attention to when the aggressive behavior usually happens, if it's before dinner time or sometime when he's hungry or after he's eaten something in particular. Make sure there's good snacks around, make sure he's having water throughout the day. Um, if he's been doing something for a long time, go sit by him, bring him a snack and water. And there also could be dietary sensitivities happening. And most of all, how is your connection with him? Are you giving him all of yourself with one-on-one -on -one time, connecting with him over the things that he loves? Does he feel heard and seen, celebrated and validated? You said that he's forced to do things because other family members want to do them. Um, in my experience, there are ways to make sure in a family everyone gets what they want and need without forcing someone to do something. If you make sure everything is a discussion and that everyone's voices are heard, then there's so many ways to make things work out. There's so many possibilities to explore with your whole family. You just have to really hear your children and let them know 
that yes, you want to make sure everyone's needs and desires get met. Uh, my family and I would have long, joyful, and often silly conversations about possibilities, ways we could do things so everyone is happy. And yes, sometimes there's grumbling in there too, but I make sure my energy is one of making sure my kids are heard and they know that I'm on their side to help them get what they want, each one of them. So we all end up in a good place and we usually throw out, throw out a dozen ridiculous possible ways of getting to a place where everybody has what they need, but we weed through those and we uh, usually most of the time come out with the right thing that feels good to everyone and follow those. So I suggest exploring that further and not just stopping with a yes or a no with um, doing things. So all of these things are suggestions for that next step after you press your reset button. So yeah, when you find yourself saying and doing the same things that you feel bad about afterward, just remember your reset button and push it and breathe and decide where you want to go in the very next moment. And a good direction to follow is one that will allow your children to feel good about themselves. Pam, what do you have to say? <laughs> um, I love both your, your focus on the reset button. That was awesome. And the, at the sensory list, cause that's a, that's a great uh, place to look for patterns. And uh, Chelsea, I love that you shared some of the wonderful things that you see in your son. And, and it's great to keep those at the forefront. And I just wanted to say that five and seven is definitely not too late. You know, we, it's never, never too late to deepen our relationships with our children, with with other adults, with anyone and connect more deeply with them. So that's awesome. Um, you mentioned, uh, that you see your son parroting your behavior. And I think that's a great observation, especially because it's your behavior that's under your control. So that's a place where you can really start to dig in and, uh, start sink, uh, thinking through things. You can work on ways to manage your own temper, temper, and um, you can share little tidbits that you learn about yourself and the things you're figuring out with your children along the way so that they too see that this is a journey, especially your son. And it's not just a stop doing that and everyone's expected to stop, right? It's, it's a process of uh, learning our own triggers, understanding our reactions, um, figuring out ways uh, to take that breath and pause so that we can choose our actions and reactions, right? Instead of them being automatic, kind of like that, you know, you, if the concept of a reset button helps, that could be a place where you can um, use that to help yourself pause for a moment. Um, to talk a bit too about uh, the fact that he's feeling uh, forced into doing things that the rest of the family wants to do, that's something that you can stop doing and start incorporating his needs more into your plan. Um, Anne talked about that a bit, and I'll post a link to a blog post that I wrote where I talk about how we work through times when, you know, two of my kids wanted to do something and the other one wanted to stay home. And interestingly, when I went and looked it up, the post is called Unschooling and the Power Paradigm, because as you noted, these struggles are so often rooted in power. So that might be able to help you, uh, have a new way of looking at things, um, at home, you can be careful to be close by. I know that was a big thing uh, when my kids came home from school. Um, you know, don't let your daughter become a physical target. Be close by to start to notice the patterns earlier, try head them off, and to step in if things bubble over. Um, and when you're talking about uh, the physicality, the sensory list is great. And you can also explain the ways that you don't like being touched and why, and just point them out when they happen and just stop them. Say, you know, please don't do that. Matter of factly, not judgmentally again, because you know that it will take time for him to absorb the messages and, and help him think of other ways um, to accomplish what it was that he was trying to accomplish when he got there. So maybe sensory, um, is what he's looking for, some sort of sensory experience, or maybe it's something else. So again, looking at the patterns um, and working with him will help you guys dig into that. 
and also show him that you respect his needs as well. So you don't like to be touched in certain ways and he doesn't like to do certain activities. Those are all related and it comes down to building trust in the relationship, connection instead of power. So look out for those patterns and start to see in the bigger picture how um, the relationship is what's at the root of all these different things. How about you, Anna? Oh, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so we all, we're thinking we're all thinking on the same lines today because my first thing was each day is a new day, each moment is a new moment. You know, and so and and but I love, love, love and you know, reset button idea and I'm thinking we need to make one of those like they have for the yes, staples right. and then you yeah. know, so we can <laughs> my, 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 I almost brought my yes button to use and right, <laughs> right, like the yes button because then you know, anybody can see it and go, you know what, reset let things have gone awry. This isn't where I wanted it to go. Let's start again. You know, it's kind of that physical representation of that. So I love that. But of course we can do it in many ways, but I just had that, I kept visioning the button you know, when you we were saying it. Um, I was also going to mention the sensory diet, um, the sensory activities in the diet. Cause I feel like if you can meet those sensory needs in a way that works for him and for the family, you're going to find that those behaviors that aren't working fall away because those needs are being met. And for us with the diet pieces, we just looked for patterns like Pam talked about. And for us, it tended to be artificial dyes or dairy that were involved in kind of those aggressive behaviors and that were more physical. And so sometimes it's just helpful to kind of go, Oh, okay, that may be an issue. And how do we feel about that? And talk, have just opening up conversations about how our body feels when we eat certain things. Um, and, and then with Pam too, it was the same thing I've written about, um, you know, finding tools for yourself and for your husband, model stepping away when you're upset, breathing, getting a glass of water, touching the earth, you know, whatever thing kind of grounds you and apologizing. Cause I feel like that transparency can help your kids see that we all have moments, but what we choose to do next, you know, that makes the difference in our relationships. And so finding those little touchstones or tools that you can share in an open process helps them see, okay, we all are working on this together. And I think that just feels better and you'll see everybody kind of, it just feels better to work in those directions together. So same thing that you guys said, <laughs> Yeah, I like right. that piece about um, how important it is your the choice after, right? Because right. we don't always make the best choice in the moment, mm -hmm. but it's acknowledging that and mm -hmm. and right. trying again, reconnecting, reconnecting. Yeah, yep. the reset, reconnecting. reset button gives you space to yeah. apologize and right. reconnect. And, and you know, we're we're not in our right minds when we have those moments, and so the reset button is is you know brings us back to our our full selves ourselves again, our best selves yes. let's make Beautiful. that reset button baby yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking that up afterwards pam <laughs> makes note <laughs> okay so i will move on to question two if you guys are ready yep so this is um from tracy who is also from florida i think our other one was from florida too um, hello, Pam, Anne, and Anna. Thank you so much for this podcast and the monthly Q&A, your source of inspiration and encouragement. I thank you. I have also, I have so many questions and I've been meaning to send, but today I will start with one. I will give you a little intro first. I have two amazing daughters, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. My oldest daughter has a huge heart. She loves people. Her gift is encouragement. She can walk into any room and know who it exactly needs unconditional love and a big hug. The little one is the life of the party. Her sense of humor astonishes me on a daily basis and we laugh together a lot. I could give you a huge list of all my favorite qualities each poses, but there wouldn't be enough time for other questions. We've been <laughs> homeschooling for three years. I don't feel confident enough to call myself an unschooler, but we have never used curriculum and I have been in de-schooling mode for the whole three years. My goal being to move towards a radical unschooling lifestyle. The most challenging part in homeschooling for me is to be an active witness to the social challenges my daughter faces, my daughter's face. I don't want to sound negative, but this is the only way I can think of posing my question. Do you know that kid in the playground that all the other children avoid. We've all seen them. They go from click to click looking to connect and is generally received with a face of disgust. The other children tend to turn their backs in hopes that the child will get the hint 
or they straight out run away from them. That kid is my eldest daughter. She is so friendly and brave that she doesn't give up and usually does find another child to play with. I decided long ago that homeschooling park days with big, big groups was not good for us. We stick to more one-on-one -on -one play dates to give other children an opportunity to see how amazing she is without the group mentality interfering. When she was younger, she was more willing to let me help. When I saw that the other children wanted space, I could call her over or kneel by her and say something to the point of, do you see her body, how it's pulled away? She's trying to tell you she wants space. Let's go look for another friend that might want to play. Also, I have no problem being the friend that plays with them at the park and do it often. But lately, I find that she doesn't want my help. She doesn't want me to talk her through the social challenge and just gets angry with me and insists on staying around children that obviously don't want to play with her even or even be close to her. I think she has started putting together that it's not that the children want space, but that they want space from her. It breaks my heart and the whole experience is emotionally draining for me. On good days, I'm able to keep it together. On bad days, I tend to break down in ugly ways. I do not demonize the other children because I strongly believe that all children deserve the respect and consideration that I want for my daughters. I have directly asked the child children in, in a kind way if my daughter has done something to hurt them or bother them, and usually, they usually say no. Yesterday, the situation reached a whole new level for me, and I just don't know what to do anymore. I want... I, excuse me, we attended a class at a beautiful garden. From the moment we walked in, she was being rejected left and right from children that she knows, children that she has interacted with in the past. She was extremely confused. She tried to sit with two children and they both made it clear they did not want to sit with her. I called her over to me and it took some time, but she came and sat with me. Shortly after, my youngest daughter went to the same two children and they welcomed her with smiles and she sat with them. My youngest daughter sat with them uh, and sat with them. And my youngest daughter sat with them and my heart sank. I called her over. She did not want to come. I went and carried her off. We were distracting the class. So I picked up our things and walked off with both of them. I could feel the tears in my throat. I told my youngest daughter, if your sister is not welcome to sit there, then you and I cannot sit there either. We were all upset. The three of us went and explored the garden on our own. And when we saw the group again, we tried to rejoin, but it wasn't much different. The wound is still fresh and I feel completely emotionally run down, but it is the reality of our life. I do not want to live a completely isolated life, but I just don't know what to do with all of this anymore. I would love your perspective and guidance. How do I help my eldest daughter and my youngest daughter? How should I interact with, how should my interaction with other children be? Thank you. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Tracy, I'm so sorry. I, it just, it sounds so hard and hurtful and I can just feel your love and, and, and the deep hurt that you've had from your question. And so I just wanted to give a little space for that. Um, I don't think that kids mean to be cruel, but in some situations it certainly can play out that way and feel that way to people involved. Um, it does sound like what you've already noticed that the group situations really aren't the best for your girls, um, especially your oldest. We found that to be the case for my oldest also. And I'm wondering if finding those one-on-one -on -one friends and then maybe they can go into group activities together would be a strategy to help if there's group things that, that she's wanting to attend. You know, my oldest never really clicked with other kids. She did much better with adults. Um, but I do think, and that's something we honored and, and kind of worked through along the way, but I do think it's important to separate your feelings from her feelings, because sometimes we can project our feelings that may stem from our own school baggage or situations that really aren't the same. And you want to give your daughter space for her reactions. And you might find that they're different than yours. She might not be bothered by things that are bothering you because it, yours is coming with like years of, of experience or baggage in this that maybe she doesn't have. And as she feels more supported and she has you there with her and her sister and all of these other things that are so different from what you or I might have experienced in a school situation alone in the you know cafeteria. Um, I'm not sure about the group dynamics where you are, but there might also be a way for conversations about inclusion and being kind for the whole group, you know, helping plan activities where the kids get to know each other and can find common ground. And I guess I find myself really wondering what the other parents are doing. You know, when we were in group situations, I would encourage my daughters to talk to the person who was sitting alone. And we would talk about how hard it is for new people coming into a group. And I'm just wondering what kind of modeling and conversations are happening with your group. You know, we found these situations 
easier to facilitate in homeschooling groups than in a school situation. So maybe reaching out to your fellow parents for some thoughts and strategies. Um, and I just want to say too, just, you know, do care for yourself and your wounds around this. Um, because I feel like that way, if you're giving yourself space and caring for yourself about it, you don't have to hand those feelings over to your girls being there to support their experience separate from their experience, be the neutral observer instead of the interpreter, which is kind of what you're doing now. Um, I think you'll learn more about what's happening and how they're feeling about it that way, as opposed to kind of putting your narrative onto them. But it's certainly complicated and it's certainly so, so hard to see um, our children in a situation where they're hurt. And I have been there, so I know that it is hard. And so I just wanted to say that. Um, but I am going to turn it over to Anne and see what thoughts she has. <laughs> Why, thank you. Hi, Tracy. Um, I have had a friend talk to me uh, last year about a situation that's very similar to what you're saying here. Um, not exactly, of course, but I do want to share uh, the story with you in case there's any chance you're able to glean some light and direction and hope from it. Um, so as I said, my friend uh, tearily spoke of her daughter's situation of not fitting in with the other girls, of being left behind and left out of things the girls were planning and doing. And I validated how hard that was to witness, especially when it's your own child, but even more difficult when we feel like it was us as a child as well, as Anna was saying. And this was true in um, my friend's case also. Um, later on that day, I was observing this mom and how she is with her daughter. And I went up to her later and I said, do you see that you are your daughter's best friend? And she did not. And I told her about all the things that I had been a witness to between um, not only her and her daughter, but also her husband and their daughter. Both of this child's parents are this girl's best friends. They were together doing the things that the daughter wanted to do. They were all participating and they were having a ball. They were laughing and talking and creating and playing. And, you know, it's very much what most unschooling families I know look like, which is a beautiful thing. We are our children's best friends and they are ours, some of their best friends. And, you know, that doesn't mean that that eliminates the child's desire for a friend who is a child. But if you are aware of the fact that you are or can be fulfilling that role as your child's good friend, best friend, then that will allow space for your daughter to flow into just the right circumstances with just the right people at just the right time. This happens when you continue to follow the things that she loves that make allow her to shine. And you you jump into that space with her um, like my friend does with her child and we've done with our children. Um, if the child is receptive to us doing so and where the child is shining, uh, just, you know, as a best friend would do. And you expand that space into other things that are tangents from this shining space. You laugh and you play and you create together. Most importantly, you don't put her in situations where you know she will end up feeling bad about herself. Um, after that first conversation with my friend later on, I received a huge gift. Um, and I was able to witness her daughter with other girls, with the other girls. I'm friends with all these little girls and I love them and I see each of their individual shine so clearly. And on this occasion, I was at first with all the other girls and they were giggling and doing silly things and their energy just flowed so easily together, you know, just little girl energy swirling around each other and in and out of each word they spoke and each giggle they released and it was really beautiful. And then my friend's daughter joined in and the other girls were kind to her and what happened was they just continued to live what they knew to live with that easy flow of girlfriendness that they had been living with each other, the talking, the silliness, the giggling. And that wasn't what the ch a new child coming in was all about. So that, that was an amazing thing that I could feel the difference in energy of my friend's daughter in this amazing child compared to the energy of the other girls. It was clearly night and day. I could feel the depth and gravitas of this girl. 
And I could not wait until I saw her mom again because I needed to tell her that it's not her daughter that's not fitting in. It's just night and day. And just like you said about when you were talking about um, your daughter, she loves people. She has a huge heart. Her gift is encouragement. She can walk into any room and know who exactly needs unconditional love and a big hug. That is a beautiful gift and a beautiful thing to see in her. And that's who she is. Not all um, eight-year-olds are like that. So it is a night and day kind of energy flow here. And so, you know, it's the way things are. And maybe it's a challenge right now in um, their lives. My, uh, referring back to my friend. And maybe it's so noticeable right now in their lives and feels like rejection right now. But it's not really. It's just that people, the people they've come across thus far, um, Perhaps it hasn't been a wide enough sampling of people to include someone who has energy like her daughter. So I was telling my friend this, and as I was saying that I was I was crying, and she was crying mostly because, uh, going back to what Anna said, we realized it was us also in school, and um, you know here we were made we were made to feel like we were the oddballs that we didn't fit in, and yet it was just because nobody really saw us and our completely different energy and how it did not fit in with the um, other, you know, little girl energy or whatever. So that felt really good to to notice. So, um, you know, and you know, it's exactly this person, this person uh, who has these individual qualities, gloriously unique qualities, for whom I've been sharing my message for decades of making sure we create a world that allows our children to shine and be celebrated for being exactly who they are, that we notice their qualities and their, uh, you know, beautiful uniqueness, as you pointed out about your child. So from this place, you might be able to see easier how you are and how you can be your daughter's best friend, focusing on her shine um, her perfect beingness that's so lovely and so necessary in our world. And seeing and celebrating that will take you both to the places where she knows she shines, where she's comfortable in her own skin, in this, this world that you can create or that you've created that allows her to shine, surrounded by people who see and want to be around her. And from there, I really have found this to be true in our lives. All else kind of falls into place. Um, because this was my son's, my oldest son's case as well. You know, the right person that she connects with will be there when you create this world where she's surrounded by her own shine and those people. And maybe that person is an adult, as Anna said. My oldest son, his best friends were always adults. Maybe that person's the librarian or a relative or the adult holding the workshop you attended on something she's interested in. Or maybe that person is another unschooled child that you run into by following her shine and they connect because they are interested in the same thing and they have a similar energy level and, and they will, they will find each other because of that. The thing is that it won't matter to your child. This is what I love because you're having such a good time in your lives together that anyone else who comes into it is kind of the cherry on the top of your unschooled life Sunday. And uh, the, because you created this world by surrounding her with these people who see her shine and that allows her to see and feel her own shine. And, uh, you know, that's all just so right and good. And once again, the goal is to allow your child to feel good about herself. Pam. Oh, I love that cherry on top of an unschooling Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a couple things. I, the, because we we keep we talk about children um, in general, and it's it's also important to realize that it's about helping um, them find situations in which they shine individually, right? Because so maybe for your daughter, your eldest daughter, it's one on one or small group kinds of environments, um, and for your youngest, it's the larger groups that she loves. They don't need to um, do and enjoy the same activity activities, right? Uh, or, or because they, they may have very different personalities. So it's, um, 
figuring this out for each of them individually, you know, not expecting each one to enjoy what the other one enjoys. There's nothing wrong with them being individuals and having different interests and different environments that they enjoy and stuff. So that's something, just a quick thing to remember. I mean, it sounds logical, but sometimes when you're there, you know, we're all going to the gardens or we're all going to this place, you know, it can seem like an either or with both. You're just kind of like lumping your children together, but it's great to separate them out and start playing with those, um, those different possibilities. Um, and to dig into a bit, I, you guys both mentioned the separating our feelings from our kids' feelings. I have a blog post called When You and Your Child See Things Differently. So, you know, talking about um, you seeing the actions of the other kids and, you know, pulling her away and trying to explain um, that they're expressing their feelings through these actions and she's not seeing it. So I, I thought I'd just share a little bit from that post. In my experience, when there seems to be a stalemate of sorts, what's often missing is the parent's genuine understanding of the situation from their child's point of view. Sometimes as parents, we forget that what we are sharing is our perspective, our interpretation of the situation, not cold, hard facts. And as different people, it's unreasonable to expect that they will always see things exactly the same way we do. What your child is telling you is their reality. The challenge is that if we are insistent, if we try to push our reality to replace theirs, we can also be pushing away the chance for a deeper understanding of and connection with them. We risk damaging the trust in our relationship. When I find myself in this predicament, I try to step back and do the work to understand my child's point of view. It helps me see them more deeply beyond they just don't understand what I'm trying to tell them. If I assume that they just don't understand, my path forward is likely to just keep explaining my point of view over and over. They'll eventually get it, right? If you find yourself repeating the same explanations, trying to convince them, that's a big clue that whatever you're saying isn't making sense. It's not connecting to how they are seeing things. So it's time to change things up. How? For me, instead of continuing to explain my reality, I try to live their reality for a while. And I explore my discomfort with the situation. I ask myself questions like, what is it that's making me feel uncomfortable? And why is that? You know, that's as an aside, that'll be, you know, where, where we start to see, um, how it relates to experiences maybe that we've had as children when we find ourselves in those situations. So following up each answer with more questions as I dig deeper, doing the work to understand my reactions and move past my defensiveness and filters. This helps me to more clearly see my child's world through their eyes. If they aren't bothered by things, I try on what it feels like to not be bothered. And vice versa. I'm a detailed yet detached observer for now. What is it that my child anticipates or sees in the goings on? How are they reacting or not reacting? Why? Why not? Where does that lead them? As you continue to observe, keep the communication between you both open and safe. You've made your concerns known. After all, that's when you realized your differing viewpoints. So your child is aware of them. If a parent makes too big a deal about something, as judged by their child, there's a good, excuse me, there's a good chance that if a challenge does arise, a child, the child might choose not to talk to the parent about it because the I told you so, whether or not literally spoken out loud, would be too heavy in the air. Understanding your child's world more deeply can help you develop trust in them and their actions. And from there, you are in a more knowledgeable place from which to help them process and move through what they see. If it's not something in their world, and when you point it out, they see no big need to incorporate your feedback into their day-to-day -day actions, then maybe they really don't yet need to react to it. If they can't see it yet, it's because it's not on their radar. You can help them understand their world more deeply by seeing what they see and being open and available when they notice new things and begin to incorporate them into their expanding worldview. Just because they don't see something now doesn't mean they never will. And that point where you uh, had mentioned in your uh, note, Tracy, that she would just starting to maybe notice um, that these reactions were happening more often around when she was around rather than, um, in general. And I know it's, it's so hard to see and, uh, you know, big hugs for those situations, but being there with her 
and letting her take that lead to let her process instead of jumping in and trying to avoid those situations, right? You're helping her process what it feels like to her, what it means to her, what she can take from that, what she might want to try next time. You know, that's all part of a, a deeper connection and relationship with her instead of um, trying to be so protective that uh, they don't get to figure these things out, assuming they want to, you know, if she wanted to be there in the first place, if this is something she wanted to do, which sounds like it was. Anyway, um, so yeah, just let your daughter take the lead for a while and see where that goes. You don't need to jump in all the time. Um, I, I swear for me, so often when I manage to work through that and and just stay back a bit and give it a little bit more space... So often I was amazed at where uh, my child and the other children involved ended up taking things, you know, they, they're just brilliant examples sometimes of, of how to work things through. And, you know, that she wasn't bothered and she was, that meant that she, you know, if it was Lissy uh, in some situations, she was getting something out of it that was worth way more than, than the aggravations of the situation. So it wasn't my judgment to say, Ooh, that's a yucky environment, you know, leave when I mention it and see it didn't bother her at all. Then that was my clue to like, oh, she's getting something else out of it and to start looking at it from that perspective and see. Okay. That was long. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, question number three is from Bridget, and Bridget is from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, she writes, I have six kids, ages 18 to six, and we have always homeschooled. My husband and I are both educators. I have been home with the children since the first was born. We did use what I've called a relaxed, eclectic approach with the first three. I mostly focused on math and phonics. The kids basically learn to read on their own. I need to diverge a little and say I was involved in a parenting webpage that was gentle, discipline, positive parenting, and attachment parenting. So I believe our homeschooling evolved out of that philosophy. I'm in Ohio and have had the luxury of attending an unschooling convention every year, except one, since it began at a water park in our state. I admit I first went just for the discount offered to homeschool families. However, I did find through the years speakers who were confirming the things I'm doing here at home. So a couple of years ago, after a convention, I told the kids we were done with school and we have tried not to look back. Here's my hang up. It's the math thing. My kids are thriving, pursuing their interests, and I'd write it all out for you. But other, quote, unschoolers I know personally and on Facebook groups seem to push math, specifically Life of Fred, like it's different because a homeschooler wrote it or because it's reading and math curriculum combined. I bought much of the curriculum before we jumped ship. It doesn't work for us. I've been working my way through your podcast. Can I really just skip math? If one of the kids chooses to do math, we go with it. I know the answer, but I have three, almost four teens, and I'm having a, I'm messing them up for life moment. For the record, my husband, 34 years in the public schools, teaches AP and honors U.S. history and is a better unschooler than me. He doesn't ever want our kids in the schools. Hi, Bridget. So nice to hear from you. And I love your question. <laughs> and for me, there are two parts, really, because as you said, I know the answer about the math thing. Um, the first part is those I'm messing up, messing them up for life moments. When I experienced those, what helped me was to engage with my kids more. So that fear of messing them up, I found was driving me into my own head and pushing me away from them. I was getting more and more caught up in those thoughts. But what I really needed was to get closer to them, to really see them in action. Because when I was actively chatting with them and doing things with them, you know, from playing games to going out places they wanted to go to, you know, just watching movies, hanging out, chatting, I saw what great kids they were and how much they knew about themselves and the world and how much they were learning about their interests. And that would always remind me that when and if that one little thing that I was worried about came up in their lives, they'd figure that out too. They have their whole lives to be in the world and learn things. And seeing them in action would put that whole curriculum content and timetable thing to shame. I could just move past it when I was reminded seeing unschooling in action, the depth of it day to day. 
So the other part of your question was math specifically. And as you know, the short answer is yes, you don't need to push math. They'll figure math related things out as they need them. But, you know, my answer can only take you so far. It will help you even more if you understand the why behind it so that you know it in your bones yourself and can remind yourself whenever you need it. So for me, it started with shifting away from seeing math as it looks like in curriculum and seeing what it looks like in real life, because it really is there all the time in the games and the art and the patterns and just the analytical thinking that weaves through our unschooling days. Um, I wrote about my own math shifts in a blog post, Math is More Than Arithmetic, which I'll link to in the show notes. Um, when I was first coming to unschooling, there was an essay that I found really interesting back then, and you can find it online at the Mathematical Association of America's website. It was called A Mathematician's Lament, How School Cheats Us Out of Our Most Fascinating and Imaginative Art Form. So I'll link to that. And Sue Patterson has a bunch of great math links on her Unschooling Mom to Mom website, and I will link to that as well. Anna? Uh, yes. So uh, I, I love that article <laughs> and it's super, super <laughs> long, but it's worth reading. And because I love math, love, love, love did, you know, well in school, blah, 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 all of that. But what I have enjoyed so much about our unschooling journey is watching the girls, um, their understanding of math, this, kind of deep organic understanding of numbers is so different from the way it's taught in school. And that mm -hmm. article really speaks to that, how we are kind of ruining math for everyone. <laughs> and, and a lot of times I think people that have fear about math are people that, you know, are so-called would say, I hate math or I did terrible math or I can't do math. But what, again, I remind people is just what you said, Pam, is that math is everywhere. It really can't be avoided. You're using it every single day, every, all the time, cooking, shopping, walking through the house, buying fabric, doing, you know, crafts, whatever it's there. And if you find that a child or teen wants to dig deeper into kind of advanced math or some more computation type things, it, it's there and it's easy. And another great article David Albert wrote about the Sudbury School experiences where of learning, you know, K through 12 math in a matter of I may have been eight weeks. I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't long. And yeah. so, you know, because those kids were ready, they had expressed an interest and they were like, let's see what this is all about. And they just buzzed through it. So, you you know, there's a lot out there about that, which, you know, can kind of calm those fears. But again, for me, what I've so enjoyed being a person that loves math is seeing how differently they looked at things. You know, I had a long division or I, you know, knew how to do these appropriate ways, but the way they think about it in their head is just, again, so much more organic and they understand the numbers so much more. So I just thought that was very cool. So yes, I think that math curriculum just gets in the way of math understanding and that mathematician's lament really talks up to that. So that is all. Okay. I will be third. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, I just yes. had an Ender's Game flashback. <laughs> <laughs> yes to all that they said. And um, I love your question. Can I really just skip math? Because unschooling is life and unschoolers do not skip life. And as uh, so they were saying, <laughs> math, math inclu life includes a lot of math. And, um, you know, we live life fully and aware and inquisitive and Math is a part of that in all the ways that they spoke of. Um, I, I simply have two little examples from our life about my kids and math. Um, um, when they, when ki unschool kids have learned about, when they want to learn something about math that life hasn't covered, then they will seek it out when they're ready to learn it. And that's um, the examples of my children. My youngest son was a chef and had to convert recipes at his restaurant. And his experience with that was um, from cooking with me from the time he was two. And I would, you know, speak out loud about the measurements and everything. And yet what he had to do at the restaurant were much more complex conversions than we ever did. So here's what he did. He learned it. 
and he learned it easily because it had real meaning in his real life. And the coolest thing that I love that Anna spoke of is that he learned it in a way that I could not understand. And Mm -hmm. I love that so much because I could see if I had tried to teach him the way I had been taught to do some of this math, it not only would have completely been inappropriate, but it would have shown lack of respect for the way his brain works and also a distrust in his ability to get what he needs when he needs it in his life, often with my assistance. And that's why we don't insert ourselves and what the ways that we had been taught things into our children's lives because for those for those very important reasons the second example is my oldest son he wanted to attend um, art college and first he had to pass the GED test and for years this was the reason why he didn't go to art college and when he got to a point in his life when he was ready he said yes I can do this And as Anna said, with the Sudbury School, um, he happily and enthusiastically studied for a month. And this was a child who brought us to unschooling because he refused to be told to do any particular any particular way of doing things ever. And if you read my essay, I am what I am on my Shine with Unschooling website, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So and here he was, though, ready to study for the GED. And within a month, he had... uh, all the knowledge of all of high school, basically (laughs) what he needed to pass the test. And because it was some for something he deeply desired, it had meaning and value in his life. So he passed the GED with high grades that did not matter to him. Um, The lowest of the grades in that he got in the GED were in the math portion that didn't matter to him. He was just so happy that he got high enough grades to continue to get accepted to the school. And once he was in college, he had to take a math course and he talked about, we talked about what to do about it. And he um, was able to take it online over the summer so that the stress of being in the classroom was removed. And he was able to take his time and really learn what he wanted to learn from the class. And that's another thing is that, um, as you know, from being in school, most uh, when we're in school, most of the time we just kind of memorize things to pass the test and forget about it afterwards. And um, as is true with the Sudbury um, school kids and everything and with my child that he really wanted to learn stuff from it. Imagine that, you know, <laughs> taking a class, a school class and really wanting to learn. So it's just so cool seeing it all with um through their fresh eyes, you know, from my school eyes, I just such a gift. So, you know, just like reading and anything else unschoolers choose to worry about trust is crucial. Trust in our kids and their paths. Um, Trust in their universes unfolding and presenting them with the exact right opportunities in the exact right time. We don't have to single out math from that at all. It includes everything. And most of all, trust in their innate ability and desire to learn things when they want or need the information in their real lives. I think that's such a huge piece. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Can I jump in? Yeah, because we, I think it's that whole 18 years, right? I think that can be something that's so hard that to once you can get past and realize that they can learn anything, any time, they don't need to know X, Y, and Z, whatever those are for you by the time they're 18, right? When you look at learning as a lifelong thing, they really can learn it when the need or the interest comes up. Right. It's, it's just such a different way of looking at things. And it's, it's, It was a huge aha moment for me because I could see like, like uh, Jacob, when he had that need, boom, like the Sudbury Valley kids, when they decided they were interested, boom, you know, it has nothing to do with age. Breaking, breaking, learning away from age is a huge thing. It's so worth Mm -hmm. it. Well, and how presumptuous, this is what I come away with all the time, how presumptuous of schools to presume, (laughs) presumptuous, 
what um, <laughs> what a child, what a person will need in their lives. The right. whole, it's all based on you may need this someday. Well, it means nothing to me right now. So it's nothing to me. I'm going to memorize it and forget it the minute I walk out of the test. And mm-hmm. when it is, you know, a value, that's when it's real learning. And that's why unschooling is real learning. Yay! <laughs> Very cool. All right, we have one more question from Yannick in Quebec. Yannick writes, Hi, unschooling seems like a dream to me, but my son is autistic, and I feel like I will have to bend the unschooling, quote, rules, so to speak, because he needs structure. I won't be able to just let it go all the time. He will need my help on many things, but rarely asks for it. So I will have to hover a bit in order to find that fine balance between entirely child-led and planned homeschooling. How would you handle it? Hi, Yannick. Uh, I hear your question, and I'm going to first dig down into some of the other things that you wrote. Uh, First, I'd like to start with what you may be thinking unschooling is, basically, because that's a good place to start. Um, Mm. I know you put the words unschooling rules in quotes, so I assume that means that you know that there are no unschooling rules, which is great. (laughs) Uh, And the reason why there are no unschooling rules is because, of course, every child is gloriously unique. Every family, every life, every path should be celebrated and followed because it is gloriously unique. And yet, even though unschooling has no rules, um, there are some basic, I think I want to say guidelines here. So when you say that your son needs structure and therefore you won't be able to just let it go all the time, unschooling is not that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> unschooling is not just letting go of structure or anything else all the time. And that's because unschooling is about seeing, honoring, and living in the flow of the child's life, of the child's shine. So a guideline of unschooling would be to not just let go of everything, whether your child needs it or not. A guideline would be the opposite, to be a student of your child and to know what your child needs in his life in order to feel good about himself, in order to shine. I've said that 5,000 times today. (laughs) (laughs) And not only follow that, but live in your child's light with him as a partner and a friend, someone who's genuinely interested in the things he is interested in. And that brings me to the part where you say um, you'll have to hover a bit in order to find that balance between entirely child led versus planned homeschooling. Neither of those actually are guidelines for unschooling. And I know it seems like the first one is, but the way you have entirely child-led on the end of the spectrum, I just want to be clear that um, it's not, unschooling is not leaving the child alone to figure out life and live life on his own, doing what he wants all the time. Uh, Yes, unschooling is child-led, and that's because we determine our direction from where our children lead. I've again, I've said that numerous times in this podcast also to follow the child's shine. And yet that's the key word to follow. Um, we're with the child and the child's interests and the child's questions and the child's joy. And we follow because we're a partner in all of those things, sharing our genuine interest and curiosity right alongside of them in what they are interested and curious about. Um, sometimes we're holding the lantern for them as they dig, but more often than they're more often than not in my family. Anyway, I was the one doing a lot of exploring and investigating to find even more ways to bring the things that my child loves into his life. So when you are your child's partner in joy and curiosity and exploration, um, much of the time you're just having conversations about the things that your child loves and doing it with them. There's not like a big separation of needing to know when he needs help or not, because you, uh, you've been a student of him. You're there, you're help helping. um, You can feel when he needs help and when he is receptive to your offering of help. And he knows he can count on you for that because that's what you're doing all along. You're furnishing him with, you know, bits and pieces of, Uh, things that he loves all along the way. Um, You're generally interested in and enthusiastic about those very things that he loves. So life is 
more about a flow of ideas and conversations and information. You're offering things to him and you're also learning things from him. And that is one of the most beautiful things about unschooling. And so getting back around to um, your structure questions, if you feel he would like some structure in his days, then that's fantastic. It's important that you honor your child and convey that you trust not only him, but you trust in his trust of himself. <laughs> Does that make sense? You trust in his knowing himself and what he needs in order to feel good and whole and centered. Um, my oldest son thrived on routines, not structures. So you, you might want to you know, think about the difference between those two things. Structure um, is very firm and routine uh, goes along with the flow. You kind of do the same things at the same times, roughly every day, but still you're always going with the flow. Um, my son was someone who needed a lot of space around transitions, um, transitioning from doing one thing to doing another thing. He needed information beforehand about what we might be doing and what it might look like. And then if he was reading or playing a game or drawing as the time grew closer when we would be leaving to go somewhere, I would help him with the transition by going into his world with him first. I'd take a look at what he was doing and talk to him about it, ask questions about it, and be interested in it, as I always am. Um, touching him during this time, just like touching his arm or something, was important, too, because it helped him to connect with me to transition from, you know, his all-consuming his brain loved to be consumed in what he was doing. So this would help him to come out a little bit and slowly into what me being there. And yet I was still there by him in his world. And then after that, I could shift to giving him information about what we had talked about, what we would be doing and let him know how much more time he had before we needed to get ready. So that's just one example of how to be a partner with your child um, and help him to feel good about himself in a way that isn't so much st as structure, but following their flow and what they need with every moment because they are growing and changing and evolving. And as soon as you think you have it figured out, it's changing too. So it's important to keep up with them and continue to be students with them and um, get on that awesome flow that they have. And once again, the whole goal is so that he can feel good about himself and then you know you know where to place your next step along your path and to help him along the, the way if and when he does want you to do that. Pam? Very cool, very cool. Um, I, just to reiterate, yeah, it really, really helps to move past thinking of unschooling as having any rules. And as you're digging deeper into, you know, the principles of unschooling, um, or guidelines, you'll you'll realize that what it looks day to day for individual people and even individual families can be very different because like being a student of your child, it's based on the needs and wants of the child. There really is nothing wrong with structure or routines. They can be enjoyed by a person. They can help them feel good about themselves without having them imposed on them from somebody else, right? The, the huge difference is it's down to choice. As the child figures out um, how they're more comfortable moving through their days, you're helping them figure that out. How Maybe they'll play with routines for a while. Maybe they'll find one that's really comfortable and then a few months later, you know, they may want to change it up. It's starting to feel uh, restrictive. So, you know, that's a whole fun area about learning about ourselves uh, that we can help them with. Um, and yes, it definitely will also help not to think of unschooling as child led, because when you when you think of it that way, um, it, it leads us to think of it as being hands off as us not as parents not being involved. And it's so much more accurate to think of unschooling as a supportive partnership. Um, I love the dance metaphor that Pam Sarushian used on her blog, in her blog post, unschooling is not child led learning. She writes, unschooling is more like a dance between partners who are so perfectly in sync with each other that it is hard to tell who is leading. The partners are sensitive to each other's little indications, little movements, slight shifts, and they respond. Sometimes one leads and sometimes the other. 
That has been my experience too. And she used the phrase child focused instead of child led because yes, we are in relationship and in partnership with our children and we're helping them figure all these things out. Um, but that's why I like the word focus rather than led because um, it's not us sitting back and just waiting um, for them to ask us to get involved. It's actively living with them. Um, you know, unschooling is rooted in that connected and trusting relationship that we so often talk about here on the podcast. Um, I did uh, a 10 questions episode with Pam Sarushian and we talked about math a little bit there too. Um, so that was in episode two. I'll put a link there in case you want to listen to that one. So yeah, just help your son out as you think will help and as he's happy for your help and you guys will be dancing together wonderfully and don't worry so much about what's rules. Learn about the principles of unschooling so that it can help you um, have more ideas and ways to engage with him. But, you know, don't feel constricted by it. Feel, use it as, you know, a jumping off for exploration in how um, to live with him day to day and help him figure these things out. Anna? Yeah, I mean, really, again, so much of what you all have said. I also have a child who really likes, needs, craves this kind of routine and structure in her day. It was especially true when she was younger. Um, but that structure and those routines were really about her day and how it unfolded, what will happen when. And it came from her. You know, I didn't need to structure her learning with a curriculum. I didn't need to structure her day. I just listened to what she needed, you know, answering questions, giving plenty of notice when things were happening. We had a calendar that she could see easily to know when events were coming up that might impact her. You know, and within that structure, uh, you know, of her own creation, she explored the topics and area of, of interest with my help and facilitation. So while I think it's this common phrase that you'll hear in circles labeled special needs, it t that tends to be more about parents imposing a structure than about kids creating their own structure or routines. And really, to me, that skill of creating that which calms and comforts is the skill that I wanted my daughter to be able to develop, that I wanted to be there with her to help her find ways that made her feel comfortable. So I think if you can kind of, you know, again, partner in, in this dance with your son, you'll find ways that he's exploring within this framework that you create in a place that feels comfortable to him. And, you know, he'll develop that structure that works for him. And, and the two of you will be working together, just like Pam said. So I think that's really the paradigm shift in unschooling. I think still maybe where you are just based on your question is that it's, you know, this educational model and it's child led and it's this. And I think it's, you know, kind of maybe set that aside for now and, and dig into the relationship and, and that partnership of moving through the days and finding the things that make you both feel comfortable and it makes, makes your days go smoothly and enjoyable and finding the things that you love and gives you opportunity to explore. And I think when you switch the focus to there, you'll see how it just unfolds in a, in a very different way than, you know, parent deciding about this structure that we're going to impose on someone. So anyway, right. I, I would love to, I, I would mm -hmm. love to go back to your question. Um, Yannick, and you say unschooling seems like a dream to me, but my, but my son is autistic. Even just a shift right there to mm -hmm. unschool. Yay. My, you know, my, I can unschool my son. This is fantastic because of what you can do to, I mean, unschooling will save him really. I mean, not, yes. not that he needs to be yeah. safe, but, but, um, you know, that, that shift in your thinking, um, will open up everything, everything, not you can't unschool because he's autistic. Thank God you can, um, unschool, right. um, because He'll he be is so much more comfortable. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You can follow him. And, and as all, as we've been saying, it's the dance, it's the flow and it's, it's just a beautiful thing. So. Well, and, and as Anna said a couple of times today, it's that it's that unique path for each child. I mean, that is the beauty. So there is no 
perfect unschooling child. There's no particular way that an unschooling child is supposed to look or be or process the world. The mm-hmm. whole point is we can have this individual path based on what that child, how they interact with the world. And so it's the perfect solution <laughs> in that right, way. And I think For, you ha- you ha- oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. <laughs> I think you had a really good point, Anna, when you were saying um, your focus was to help um, your daughter be comfortable because this, you know, this is huge, huge where schools and special programs, special needs programs and everything just, you know, have so much of uh, trying to fix. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. here in our lives, we can celebrate. And that is all that matters. So you can do whatever needs to be done to once again, make sure your child feels good about himself and is comfortable and knows how to um, feel comfortable, knows how to be in touch with himself, to know how he feels and everything. And the learning happens along the way, (laughs) you know? I I think of my son now and he's 20, goodness, he's 27. (laughs) Math has to be wrong right there. But he knows he's had a life of me assisting him to feel good about himself, to know what situations will put him over the edge. So we, you know, and as I've talked about in the past questions, we created a world of people who see him shine so that he doesn't feel um, bad about himself. And this is, this is, this is my guideline for unschooling this life um, for our children so that once they are on their own, like my kids, they, they carry these gifts with them, this knowledge, these skills, but yeah, mostly knowledge about who they are connecting with who they are and what they need. And that's what they follow to this day still. So, and the learning happens along the way. That's honestly just, (laughs) The yeah, cherry, the icing the on the cake. The, the cherry <laughs> on the unschooling life Sunday. <laughs> I know it's just amazing. That's for me. That's one of the biggest things is how much they understand themselves and mm-hmm. how much how they how they can move forward. Um, you know, because they know they change with time. Their interests change, um, and it's it's seeing them knowing ways to figure out how they mesh with the world, you know, finding situations that, that will fit in, you know, in which they'll shine and, you know, being able to look at situations and say, Hey, you know, that's not going to work for me and moving on, not feeling judged by that. It's just so beautiful to see them in action with the world. And I think that's, you know, let's end it on that note, Anna, your point that there is no perfect unschooling child, right? There's no, right. oh, here's this kind of child and unschooling is going to be perfect for them. No, the unschooling starts with the child, with any yeah. child, with the child who he or she is. And, and it grows from there, right? Right. Because unschooling is about that child, just that child. Yeah. That's- child focused. I love that. Okay. Thanks so much to both of you for answering questions with me. I loved it. Had a great time. And just a reminder. Thank you. There are links in the show notes for things that we've mentioned. We mentioned a lot of things uh, (laughs) this month. (laughs) And as always, if you would like to submit a question for the Q&A show, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the first book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Learn, Five Ideas for a Joyful Unschooling Life. In it, I share the five paradigm-changing ideas that most help me better understand unschooling. Reviewers have said... A quick read, but packed with ideas that challenge the dominant paradigm of our failing approach to learning, this little gem makes an excellent argument for unschooling. And, I was rather doubtful about this book, as I had never heard of the author, but after reading it, I wish that I had read it years ago. I hope you find it helpful too. Free to Learn has also been translated into French and Spanish. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.